So this is the famous Susan Gilbert Dickinson, uh, wife of Emily's brother, Austin, and the uh, person that Emily dedicated a lot of these poems to. And critics uh, have said, and you know, I, I defer to your expertise here, uh, Dad, because you've dedicated your life to these, these subjects, these things, poems and books and literature and all that, uh, that the two women were lovers. And others say uh, that their affection was uh, normal between 19th century women. Yeah, I, I tend to think it was more normal, um, just simply because it was like this. Um, and in those days, it didn't matter what your sexual orientation was. You were expected to get married, mm -hmm. period, in a discussion. So even if Susan Gilbert was um, her lover, she would have still had to marry because um, she would have needed somebody to financially support her. You know, women had no means of financial support. They were either supported by their, their husbands, their fathers, or their brothers. That, that was it. Okay. They, right. they couldn't live on their own. None of that kind of stuff went on. They, they were expected to be supported by them. So, um, it's not strange that Susan Gilbert would have married. It, it's Emily would have been the one that was considered a little different because she was living this life of solitude and, and not getting married and didn't seem to be interested in men at all or whatever. Um, and she had a very close relationship with a, another woman. And I could see where rumors would start about that because Emily wasn't following the norm. But Emily, as we're learning, never followed the norm. No, no. Did but again. Thing. And that's what yeah. made her a genius. Yes. Yeah. Again, she may have been a lesbian. I don't know. I, I tend to lean more towards it was just a, a, a very, very close friendship. And but you're, I don't, you're I probably don't. right. Again, you know, I, I, I bought this off of Teachers Pay Teachers, which is a, you know, a, a reputable site to go to for resources for, for right. K to 12 homeschooling adult education. But, you know, I don't know the lady that put this together. I know you. So if you yeah. say it's a, you know, it's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. But I, once again, I don't know this, this whole lesbian stuff is new. Like I said, five years ago when I was talking about and looking up stuff on Emily Dickinson, there was nothing about her being a lesbian. I right. nothing that I saw and anything. Um, now all of a sudden it's there. I don't know if the, um, that new Dickinson show on, um, Apple, Apple is maybe lending some, uh, ideas or creating some ideas in people's heads or, or whatever. I don't know, but, um, and, and that very well could be TV shows. I mean, the crown, uh, has, has, put a whole lot of fuel on, on imaginary fires about the history of the British Royal family. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. So, uh, Emily was a prolific writer. Uh, again, we know that poetry was the special calling that she had, but her poetry was very private. How many did you say? Seven poems were only, yeah, only seven poems were published during her lifetime. Right. No one know, knew how much she was really writing, but her sister found 1700 poems. Yeah. Now a I, I, anyway, a prolific amount of poetry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, I think my, my readings have said that it was more like 1800 poems, but that, that's just quibbling. That makes no, um, no difference. That's it's no a, difference it's at a all. lot of poetry. Yeah. Um, and most of it is a, a poetry of a very, very high caliber. Mm -hmm. You know, that um, I don't, we don't know how long she would work on the poems, you know, you know, from the beginning to the end of a poem, how long did it take her to get through that? You know, did she sometimes just have one pop into her head and be able to write it down? Or did she, you know, artistically uh, struggle with some poems? We don't know, you know, so, um, yeah, but you've heard, you, I've heard of, of that happening with, with these types of people. And by these types of people, I mean, geniuses, 
that they've just been they just get struck by by the muse for mm-hmm. a lack of a better word and oh here we go and yeah uh, here's the masterpiece yeah so they they these poems were found at on her death in her room under the bed um i think they were in a box under the bed um and she had taken them and and she had um made them into booklets so there were i think there were three booklets where she had sewn a little leather you know it was like i said it was all these little scraps of paper so she knitted them all together or sewed them all together and put little little bindings on them so it was just these little tiny booklets <coughs> with these poems in it you know so but but a lot of poetry now the family was aware she wrote poetry and I'm sure she oftentimes shared the poetry with them, but you know, I don't know if they knew that she had written that many poems. Was it a proper thing to do for a young lady at that time to write poetry? Uh, more so than it had been. It was, uh, there weren't a lot of female writers, um, per se. Uh, but it was, it was a growing field. You know, there were, there were more females than there used to be. Um, but yeah. Louisa May Alcott comes to yeah. mind during this time. Yeah. Another yeah. female author. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't think, um, it was an unusual thing, but it was much rarer than a man being a writer. Yeah. So Emily had a, a disease of the kidney called called Bright's disease. Uh, also suffered from from an eye disorder. She couldn't write for a year. Uh, I don't know what it was. The, the, do you know was the sunlight bothering her or something like that? I, I don't know. Uh, no one really knows because she wouldn't let doctors, um, for the most part, uh, what would you call uh, evaluate her. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in her later life, when she was starting to suffer um, more severely from the Bright's disease, um, there's a real f- famous story about Emily where she finally consented to seeing a doctor, but the doctor had to sit inside a room, and that room was dark, uh, and Emily, uh, in, in the lighted hallway outside the door, the, the, the door of that room, just walked by the door once going one direction slowly turned around walked back in front of the door very slowly and then that was it the doctor was supposed to make his evaluation uh <laughs> based on that and how well so, did but that she, work out um well the doctor went a lot off of what what the sisters the sister was saying you know what, here here are all the symptoms that i've observed um and then she also at at, at a later point in life consented to go to New York, uh, to see a, a specialist. But by that time, I, I think the disease was well advanced and there wasn't anything anybody could do about it at that point. Right. Right. Hmm. So would she really speak to strangers from, from, from a visitors from another room? It, it, yeah. She, she got, she got quirky towards the end there. You know, it, it the, probably the last 10 years of her life, and and I think some of it might have been vanity to a certain degree um, that she didn't think she looked very good. Her skin certainly under Bright's disease would be turning yellow. Oh, geez. You know, because and probably the the, the white of her eyes would be turning yellow um, because as the kidneys malfunction, that's just what happens. Yeah. Um, so, you know. I think some of it was that, you know, but, you know, she, she was not, uh, this recluse everybody made her out to be. She was, she had a very rich life with her family. And like I said, she would go outside and play with the children and she liked giving them baked goods and stuff. And she wrote letters and she, um, people came to visit at the house and, you know, it wasn't until the last 10 years of her life or so when she was suffering from the Bright's disease that she became more of a recluse. So does that, does that last 10 years really then just become what people have remembered 
basically. Yeah. Okay. I think a lot of it comes from that. Yeah. Because I, I don't agree with the, the agoraphobia thing. Okay. Okay. Well, this is why I have you on for stuff like this. Cause you know, you've, you've given oh. your life to it. Wow, that makes me sound very sad. But go ahead. <laughs> As you keep repeating that, you gave your life to English. Okay. You've given your life to other things, too. But yes. you, you did. You have studied this since you were 18 It was my job, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, you know, I know you're only 36, but that's still oh, 18 wow, years thank, of expertise. Yes, thank you very and, much for uh, that. <laughs> right. uh, so she lived, obviously, 1830 to 1886. She lived during the Civil War. Um, didn't really interest her all that much, politics, social upheaval. She just stayed in her room, wrote poetry. Mm -hmm. That was what she liked. Ranged in subject. Uh-oh, go on. Well, she, I just object to the the idea that she just stayed in her room. She didn't. She didn't do that. She 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 stayed in the house. She roamed the gardens. You know, she she wasn't out on the streets and stuff. But you know, well, this is what I remember being taught myself about her. So where is all this coming from then? Um, that you object to so much. Well, I, I think, like I said, the the. There was a lot of speculation about her because she was, they knew she was there and they, she dressed in white. That's why she got the name, the lady in white. That was her nickname. Mm -hmm. Everybody referred to her as the lady in white. And, um, you know, so they knew she was there. They saw her. So it wasn't a thing where she was just in her room, you know? So I, I think, like I said, towards the end of her life, when she was doing um, poorly with her health, she might have stayed in more, maybe stayed more in her room. But other than that, I think she was out and about and around the house and in the yard and in the gardens. And, you know, she did a lot of cooking and, and that required gardens, you know, during that day and age, because right. they brought in a lot of the produce from out of the gardens. And, you know, so she, she was, she just didn't wander far from home. Think think of it as um, COVID nineteen without the COVID nineteen. That you know, I wouldn't have known what the heck you were talking about a year ago, but that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> 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 makes a lot of sense now. Yeah, the social distancing without the the disease. Yeah. Okay. And besides, I think she had this really really rich inner life. She spent a great deal of time, I think, reading and really thinking things through, spending a lot of time really contemplating stuff. Yeah. You know, and I, and I think that's pretty uh, remarkable. I do, too. I do, too. So. Yeah, she, nope. No? No, I'm just saying I, I agree. Yeah, she didn't ab uh, embrace Puritan or Calvinist. <laughs> Calvinist. <laughs> Yeah, I thought you objected um, to the information. <laughs> no, but the, the last two things there, she instead embraced nature and then she saw God in all living things. Uh, that's transcendent transcendentalism. You know, so, um, yeah. So for those who say that was, she was kind of a transcendentalist, yeah, that would be their philosophy. Is that necessarily a wrong interpretation of things? No, I don't think so. I think, I think if you look, you can find God in anything. Yeah. And that's a whole nother, you know, that's a biblical debate maybe for another class. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. So I don't, I don't think these guys were bad, but they, that's where they connected with God. Right. Right. That's where they felt closest to God was when they were out in nature. Well, church can be anywhere in any place. Yep. Really. Uh, so, this poem called back. She wrote a short note to her cousins, which read called back. And a few months later, she died. Hmm. Okay. I, we, we did a little research on this. We paused for a moment. It, the, 
called back note. It just said, little cousins called back Emily. Well, there you go. And that was thought to be her very last letter. Okay. Wow. So she was aware of what was getting said to happen. Yeah. And it seems like she had found peace with it. I think so. I think so. Yeah. So she refused the traditional funeral procession, uh, wanted her casket to be carried through a backfield to the cemetery. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And in, even in death, she preferred to go unnoticed. Yeah. There's no oh, it's on her tombstone, called back. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. So we're going to, I mean, that's the life of, of Emily Dickinson. We're going to get into her poetry here uh, right after a, a real short break. And anything else to add about her? No. Mm-mm. No? Okay. Thanks for listening. <laughs> 